Alright guys, welcome back. So, platformers. Um, it's a subject I think a lot of people have kind of wanted to see for a while now. It's a very popular kind of uh, 2D game, 2D genre as it were, um, that a lot of people are kind of interested in trying to get their feet wet making. So, um, the thing with platformers specifically and why I, you know, why I haven't started off with platformers is because they're a lot more complicated to put together than a lot of people really kind of think they are or give them credit for and there's so many different styles and, and methods and approaches of doing platformers and platform type games that um it's really hard to just give a one-size-fits-all answer to kind of you know how to make a platform it's the same with you know like how you make enemies um in the, in the previous top-down shooter um, tutorial because there's a lot of different ways you might do that so what I'm going to do to start off with is give you guys a rundown of the most basic sort of elements of a platform game that really I can imagine um, like if I show you what I've got here um, this is something I pretty much just threw together in like literally like two two three minutes um, probably less than that actually of just like the very basic fundamental systems of sort of collision, moving about and jumping because really those are the main things, um, the main obstacles you want to get out of the way so you can get started. Now I mean I've done this in the simplest way possible which means it's not a flawless system and there are some kind of glitchy things wrong with it but honestly those things are going to exist um, for quite a while until you get quite good at the sort of coding elements and stuff. Game Maker. Um, I'm going to show you what I've done through code, but because I mean, while you can kind of accomplish some basic platforming stuff using like the drag and drop systems, um, they have a lot of kind of polish problems with them. They're kind of they can be difficult to tweak and control and be exactly function exactly the way you want them to and then when something goes wrong and they they act a bit buggy or a bit glitchy you bounce off a wall or you, you get stuck in something it's really difficult to tell when you're using drag and drop why it's happening whereas when you know you put this stuff together through the GML code you know exactly what you're doing so I mean this tutorial specifically might be a bit um, out there and a bit sort of advanced I sent I guess for uh, for people who have only, you know, who the only things they know about Game Maker they've gotten from like my videos, it might be difficult for you to follow. But really, all of the concepts, and I'll explain anything that's new, uh, should you should be able to, you know, follow along and understand what's happening if you you pay close attention. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through all of the sort of stuff I've set up. Because there's quite a bit of it, I'm not, you know, doing it from scratch while I sort of talk through it. I've, I've built this in advance and I'm just going to walk you guys through it because there's quite a bit going on here and, like, it would take me a long time sort of recording and editing me, typing all this stuff down and I can make mistakes as I go along and then I would have to go back and re-record and, and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully, hopefully this is good enough and um, you guys can get a good idea of sort of how making a platform game works. Uh, in Game Maker. So, um, all we have in terms of sprites are is a sprite for a player object facing to the right, that is important. Um, I think I explained before for directions and stuff, like generally um, you want to make sure you do everything as a default facing to the right. Um, you'll see why when it comes to like how we move left and right and how we turn the, the sprite left and right. Um, we have a wall sprite that's you know, as you guess, it's just there, just for our walls and everything like that, just a 32 by 32 block. And now for our objects, um, we have an object for the player, uh, obj underscore player, an object for the wall, object underscore wall, and now what we also have here, um, this is another little sort of unique concept that will come very in handy for you to understand as we go on, is what I refer to as a parent object, which I've called part underscore wall. No different from any other object, um, it doesn't actually do anything in here. Like there are no events, no actions, like um, this object doesn't actually need to do anything, it just needs to exist and be called and be called something useful like parent underscore wall. Um, why that is, is because this object here, the object wall, has part underscore wall set as its parent. Now what that means is that this object will inherit um, this object's code. Um, so any events that are in here 
um, will basically be inherited by this object, like if it doesn't have its own. Like if this object had a create event and some actions in here, it would run its own create actions. But if, um, if this object has a create event and some actions in here and this object did not have that event, then it would inherit that event from the parent. Um, it's a very good way to sort of duplicate code without duplicating code, if you know what I mean. So you inherit it from another object if you have lots of objects that behave in a similar fashion or in a different way. And as you might imagine with a platformer, you might have lots of different walls that are different shapes, colors, you know, you know, images and all that kind of thing. But they all perform the same task of being a static object that your player collides with. So for that, I'm making all of the, the wall objects in the platformer inherit from parent part underscore wall. Because what it also means when something is a parent is that anything that we say in code to happen to that parent will also happen to all of the objects that are its children that inherit from it. So I mean that, that was a little bit complicated, but hopefully you can see how that comes into practice as I explain the code inside our player object. So our player object has three events, um, a create event, a step event, and a press R key event. Uh, the press R key event is just a debug thing for me, uh, for whenever you press R to restart the game. Um, I've done that through a drag and drop thing because it was only literally like um, like this this action here, and because that that action there is only one line of code in you know in GML anyway, so you know it's it's faster for me to just drag that action in than it is for me to type. I mean, what I could do if I wanted to be really purist to make sure I do everything through uh, code would be to do game underscore restart bracket bracket that, and that's exactly the same thing. But because those two things are completely identical, it's much easier for me to read restart the game than it is for me to read execute a piece of code and I like, have to click and see what it does. So in situations like that, you know, it might actually be more beneficial to you to use um, actions in those key specific situations where um, you're doing something that would only be one line of code anyway and would like um, not need to fit into like a block of code or an if statement or anything like that. If it's just very simple on this do this then I sometimes think actions are better that way. But um, in our create event we have some code. Um, what this does is just establish a couple of variables for us that we're going to need. Now I'm using visp and husp setting them both to zero just to establish them as variables that I can use later on. Um, if you don't set a variable or declare it using um, the var function or something like that, um, if you don't set it to equal something before you like check it for the first time, um, like if I were to say like if the vispa equals zero for example, this line of code wouldn't work at all um, because it's happening before the game even knows what vispa is. So you need to set your variables to something to what well, is called initializing them. You might notice that uh, you know what these are to represent is our uh, vertical speed and horizontal speed. Now you might be wondering, in contrast with my previous videos where I used uh, things like that, the v speed um, variable is what I'm doing is not using the built-in functions for v speed and h speed and gravity for that matter because that that is a Function. Like if I set that, then that automatically like creates gravity that it affects that affects my object. So if I left that, for example, at uh, 0.5, the object would actually fall 0.5 every frame, and it would do everything for you, um, which can be really really useful. But um, I want to have full control over everything that happens here, and I don't want to use the pre-built functions that that will apply speed to my objects by themselves. I want to basically be able to calculate and know exactly how fast I'm going to be moving every frame in every direction. So I'm using my own variables, which I've named very similar to the, uh, the built-in functions, um, for vertical speed, horizontal speed, and for gravity, which I want to be 0.5 pixels per frame. Uh, the other two I'm just setting to zero, just so that the game knows that these variables exist and I can do things with them. So, if we go in now into our step event, now there's a lot of code in here. <laughs> this is what's going to basically explain how um, how the game works and everything our player does in terms of moving around, how it gets our inputs, how it jumps up and down, how it collides with these walls. So I've broken it down into sections that I've uh, commented out. In case you don't know already, if you type uh, two slashes in the execute code thing, you get this green text, and 
it's just a comment text which means you can put in a comment to help you sort of label areas of your code and remind yourself what sections of your code do and that kind of thing I'm just using it to sort of split um, the code into sections so you can see uh, what each area of this code is for. Let me big this up because there's a lot of code in here and we'll, um, we'll go through it stage by stage so this is the step event, so this is the thing that's happening every single frame of our game. Every single frame of our game, everything in here will happen. So the very first thing we want to do at the very start is to get inputs from our player. So we want to check the left arrow key on the keyboard, we want to check the right arrow key on the keyboard, and we want to check the spacebar. And we want to know if any of those things are being pressed. So the the check for to see if um, wow that was a sentence the check for to see if uh, <laughs> the check the line of code which checks to see if uh, these buttons are being pressed <laughs> is keyboard underscore check underscore direct that will return a one if the key is being pressed and a zero if it's not being pressed at any point in time um, different to the pressed and released things like if I do that, for example, that will only return that will only return one or true if um, if the key was just pressed, like it was just pressed this frame, as opposed to like if it is being held down. So direct is the one we want to use. So it'll check those three keys and it'll put them into these variables, so that we're not, you know, I could easily put this uh, this check here down, like, and I could put it every single time, like if keyboard check. Uh, underscore direct left like I I could take this line of code here I could put it here and like that would be no different but it's easier in the long run if we just simplify those things do the actual function once and just sort of at the start of the the frame and embed the result of that into this variable so that now every time we ask if key underscore left is true we're basically asking if the left arrow key was held that frame. So <laughs> probably over explained that completely, but um, so yeah, we're checking, checking left, right, and space. So now that we know where, what inputs we're pressing, we can see uh, whether or not we're holding left or right, and we can move left and right based on it. So if key left, so if the left arrow key is being pressed, we want to set husper, which as you can remember is the, the variable we set up earlier to uh, minus 2 because we know you know if we're moving left we're moving negative so we want to set our what's going to be our horizontal speed uh, to minus 2 just a variable for now it's not actually doing anything but we're just setting it in advance we're calculating what we're going to do with our sprite so that's minus 2 what this line of code does um, image underscore x scale equals minus 1 is it will flip our sprites horizontally it'll invert the x scale of our sprite, so it'll be um, if it's because it's facing right now. If we times its x scale by minus one, it'll face left. So that's how you could see, like when I was playing the game earlier, the um, the simple sprite I have that's facing to the right. Um, whenever I move left, it'll face left because of this line of code. Um, so and then if we do the same thing again for our right key, just the other way around. So h speed, if our right key is being pressed, will equal two because it's positive because we're moving right and our x scale will equal 1, which is the default value so you know, it, it times its default value by 1 so it's just facing right as it is by default um, which will cancel out this if you were moving left at any point now these things down here are to, uh, not, not both of those things, sorry, just this thing here uh, is to deal with us either pressing both keys at once or neither key now this is cool because it helps us explain a new concept about if statements that we haven't really worked with before, I don't think anyway, and that's um, and, and or, and not. Um, we've, we've handled not a little bit before, but we'll go through everything here. So here we're checking if key right, so if the key, key right is pressed and key left is pressed. We'll ignore this bit for now. Let's just look at this bit. If the left key is being pressed and, and that's what this means here, that means and, the the right key is being pressed, then this little condition inside these brackets is true. Okay, I mean if we just like, if we ended that there for example, um, sorry, 
like if that was the line of code there, then it would check to see if both of those things are true. If either of them are false, then this will return zero and it will skip this. But so yeah, that checks both of those. And then what we've got here is or, and then another condition in brackets. So if you take like these two things in brackets to be individual things, um, this if statement requires one of either this or this to be true in order to run this line of code. So what it, the other line of code is if not key right and not key left. I'm sorry if this is all a bit word twisty and, and hard to get around, but um, I'm trying to explain it as sort of slowly and as best I can. So if this is right, so this uh, exclamation mark here basically means not. So if not key right, which means if key right is zero, so right key not being pressed, and uh, not key left. So as you can imagine, what that means is if both of these things are true, because of this and, we're checking if both these things are true, and this one is not key right and not key left, what this represents is if neither key is being pressed. So this thing represents if both keys are being pressed, and this thing represents if neither key is being pressed, and we're checking if this or this is true. So we're checking if both keys are being pressed or neither key is being pressed. And then if <laughs> if that does return true, then all we're doing is setting our horizontal speed to zero. So we're making sure that if we have a neutral input or we're pressing both keys, um, we get zero speed. It's kind of important to do that just because if we didn't do this, if this was just not here and we just left key left and key right determining our speed, then um, basically because this is executed after this, uh, our right key would take priority. So if you, you held left and right, you would move to the right. Maybe that's fine for you, but like, you know, for I think generally like as a, just as a simple polish thing and, you know, to avoid some glitches and stuff like that, it's cleaner to make sure that if you're pressing both keys, you're not doing anything because, yeah. So that's <laughs> very long windedly, I feel, um, an explanation of how we're moving left and right. Um, well, how we're working out the horizontal speed, we haven't actually moved our sprite anywhere yet. But we'll come on to that. So, jumping next in this little section. This is very simple. So if key jump um, up here, so we're checking our space key. If uh, key jump is true, then we want to just, we're asking another if question here. If grounded, now grounded, um, it's a little bit of a, a complex um, thing to suggest, actually, is that, actually, I've made a little mistake here, I should have that uh, initialized. It's working anyway, and I, I know why it is, and I'll explain in a second. But really, for good practice, I should be setting grounder to equal zero here. But, um, so, yeah, what this means is, this is a variable I use slightly later on to check whether or not we're on the floor or not because obviously you don't want to be being able to jump while you're in the air, other than for double jumps, which is a completely different topic that we'll cover a whole different time. So if we're grounded, which I'll explain later, then we're going to set our V speed, our horizontal speed, uh, our horizontal, our vertical speed, sorry, to equal minus seven to give us a short burst upwards just for this frame. It'll just set our V speed on this frame to equal minus seven. So we're, we suddenly start going upwards because it's negative uh, at a very sharp pace. And then that's all that does. So that that's the very simple approach to working out sort of a jump velocity for us. After we finish jumping, we do this line of code, which is uh, Vspa, which is our vertical speed, as I said before. I'll put space in there. Uh, plus equals grav, which is the gravity variable that we set in our create event here to equal 0.5. So every single frame, uh, we're adding our gravity to our, uh, our vertical speed. So we're slowly moving downwards by like an increasing amount um, every frame. So it gets higher and higher and higher every frame basically as well. So that's how we fall. Now, when we're falling, we want to make sure we actually hit the floor, and when we hit the floor, that we stop falling. This is kind of the bit where stuff starts to get a little bit more complicated. So, if 
place meeting. Now we already did, I think we used instance meeting in uh, the previous tutorial on like bullets colliding with enemies. Uh, the only difference between uh, place meeting and what, this line of code, instance, or is it instance place? Yeah, instance place, sorry, um, that we used before. The only difference between those two line of codes is that this one doesn't return the uh, specific ID of the thing you're colliding with. It just checks if there's a collision and it will return true or false. It doesn't tell you the specific object you collided with. So it's a little bit faster when you don't need to know the object you collided with. You just need to know that there is a collision. You don't need to know what specific objects you collided with. So uh, what this does, and I'll explain it again, is check um, it'll paste a clone of our sprite basically um, on top of its position and it will scan the coordinates you put in for a collision based on the shape of uh, the instance that's running this line of code sprite with this object which is par underscore wall which is our parent object for our wall so every so that object and all object that are its children so object underscore wall uh, will be checked for this collision um, the reason we are checking we are checking x plus y plus v speed is we're checking like um, below us for a collision so we're checking our y plus the speed that we're moving to see if we are about to hit the floor like if uh, by the end of this frame if we were to add our v speed and we were to move by that amount would we hit the floor that's what this line of code is doing now this bit is a little bit more complicated now a lot of people might assume that when you're doing um, when you're doing collisions, all you need to do, logically in your head, is work out am I colliding? If so, stop moving. That doesn't quite work. As I've just said, what we're doing here is we're checking to see if we're about to collide, not if we are colliding. So once you've, just, once you've confirmed that you're about to collide, what you need to do is move as close as possible to the thing you're colliding with without colliding, and that's how you put yourself on the floor. The reason it doesn't work if you just say, if I'm colliding, stop moving, is because by the time you're colliding, you're inside the object. You're overlapping the object and it's detecting a collision. It doesn't detect a collision if uh, you're nearly hitting the object. It it, this returns a collision if you would actually hit the object. So I've prepared a little uh, a paint diagram to kind of explain the concept a little easier. Say we're moving downwards at five uh, pixels every frame, and this is our object here. So here it moves down, it checks here to see if it's about to hit the floor, and as we can see it's not, so it moves on to over here as we can see, and it moves down five pixels as you can see through the grid. Um, if we were to then move another five and check to see if we're colliding, we would be in the floor. So you know we can't check that. What we need to do is at this point here, we check ahead of ourselves and basically create this situation in a virtual way. And we say, oh look, if we were to move five down, we would be colliding. And then once you've done that, we move ourselves as close as we can. So we move ourselves one pixel down at a time until we are just in front of the floor. And that leaves us with this, so that we're on, on the floor and we're not inside the floor. We don't get stuck in it because that's what will happen otherwise. So, we're going to use a while loop to do this. Now, what a while uh, statement does, um, similar kind of in the logic, if you think it through, to kind of how if works, you know, it's just sort of a question we're asking. So we're asking, while this thing is true, do this thing. It works similar to if statements as well, that if you do like a block of code here and write stuff in here, um, it'll say while this is true and do all of the stuff in here, but we only need to do one thing, so we're just sticking it on the end of the line of code. And we're saying while we're not hitting the floor. So while a uh, place meeting, while one pixel ahead of us, one pixel below us, is free, so if we look at the diagram again, so while this space is free, and while this space is free, and this space is free, and this space is free, and so on. So while one pixel below us is free, move us down one. And now this will loop in this will loop and continue. So like we don't execute any more frames until this little calculation is done. And that's why it can 
be a bit dangerous if you don't know what you're doing to use loops in your code because that's how you can end up with an infinite loop and end up with a crash of your game. So you have to be careful, they have to make sure that these things do end at some point, otherwise your game will crash because it'll just be stuck calculating this over and over and over and over again and, and doing this over and over and over and over again and your game will just get stuck and will crash. So while we're, you know, one pixel below us is free, move us down one pixel. And then as you can see, what'll happen is, and this is before another frame even continues. So we're like, we're, we're stuck in a frame and the computer is checking it saying, is one frame below us free? Yes, move down one. Is one frame below us free? Yes, move down one. Is one frame below us free? Yes, move down one. And so on until it gets to here. And then it says, is one frame below us free? No. And at that point, the while ends and we carry on with our code. So we get to v speed uh, vispa equals zero because now we don't need any more um, vertical speed so we remove all the effects of our gravity. Um, we, we basically cancel out what we've done there by just setting it to zero and we turn grounded to equal one so that you know we're allowed to jump again um, because we're touching the floor at this point. We know we're touching the floor so we're grounded. and. Um, so that's also why our grounded variable up here, um, like it was working even though I hadn't declared it because um, it would ne it wouldn't get to here um, before it got onto here and set it at least once because it would say it would say if key jump and we weren't pressing jump at the very start of the game so it wouldn't run this line of code because if it did it would crash because it doesn't know what grounded is yet and it would get to here and it would set grounded to either 1 or 0 and then it would become initialized but that's a bad practice and you should have that initialized beforehand because if we did get to there somehow like if you started the game and you were holding space at this point the game would probably crash because it would say if grounded oh what's grounded I don't know what that is and it would crash so um, that's why we initialized that just a sort of <laughs> bit tangential but I thought it was good to explain why that would happen um, so where even were we? Okay, so then if we're colliding, um, we move as close as we can to the floor, we set our v-speed to equal zero, and we turn on grounded on so that um, we're allowed to jump again. Otherwise, if uh, x plus y plus vespa, which at this point will be our gravity, so it'll always be at least like a little bit. So if a little bit below it is one, then is nothing, then grounded equals zero. So if there's nothing below us, then we can set grounded to equal zero so that we can't jump, so that we're in, we're considered to be in the air. And anything else that you want to apply to your player, different physics or anything like that, you would do in this space here, because this area here is what happens if we are in the air. This space here is what happens when we touch the floor. So this area, so that's how vertical collision works. You'll notice this doesn't actually deal with ceiling collisions, because that would be a different thing entirely, but I'm just trying to cover the basics and some stuff so you understand how it works and once you understand this you'll be able to kind of invert it and you know all that kind of stuff and work out how to do other things with it. So that's basically how vertical collision works. Now horizontal, we're almost at the bottom here, look we scrolled all the way down. <laughs> Not too much left to cover. Uh, horizontal collision. So now what we want to do here is almost exactly the same as what we're doing here. It's just a little bit different because we don't need to set any grounded things or any specific variables to allow us to jump when we're touching a wall unless you were doing like a wall jump system which is a different thing on it in its own right so we're checking the same sort of system again we're saying if place meeting x plus our current horizontal speed so like the speed we're about to move remember remember we haven't actually moved yet we've just set these variables up so if we're about to hit a wall then we do these these lines of code here so if we're about to hit a wall, and now we do another while loop, because we want to move ourselves as close to the wall as we can, and there's a little bit of a difference in here to this thing. Well, this is because we're... Hang on, I'll just read it out first. So while we're not... And there's the exclamation mark here. We're not colliding while there is no collision at x plus sin husper. I'll explain that in a moment. Y uh, with parent wall then x plus equals sine husper. Now what sine husper <laughs> means, um, what sine does is it will return either 1 or minus 1 uh, depending whether or not 
the this vari uh the value in its brackets, so sign bracket close bracket, and the thing inside it is positive or negative. So that means if we're moving to the right and our hispa is like two, I think it is, yeah, hispa two, then what will happen is it will return one because it's a positive number. If we're moving to the left and our horizontal speed is negative, then it will return minus one because um, it's negative. So that's what that does. The reason we need to do that is because when we are uh, falling, we're only checking a single direction below us to see if we're hitting the floor or not. When we're moving left and right, we're checking left and right simultaneously, so we need a line of code that can handle both of them. Otherwise, we would have to copy and paste this and check like plus hispa and minus hispa simultaneously, and we'd want to avoid duplicating code wherever we can. So, while we're not colliding with something on the side that we're moving towards by our hip our hate speed. So sorry, sorry, that was a complete mess of a sentence. While one pixel, say we're moving right. So while x plus sine husband, which would be one. So while one pixel to the right of us is free, move to the right one plus three. Move our x coordinate by one. So you'll notice in these two lines of code, we are actually doing some movement of the sprites. We're actually changing our x coordinate. And we're moving ourselves as close as possible to um, to the wall. So once we so we keep doing that until until the code gets to the point where, like this, only horizontal, it says, "Oh, we're here and we're about to hit the wall." That's when it stops. So it moves you one pixel at a time till it gets there. Then set our h speed h spur to zero um, because obviously at that point we don't want to move any more. Um, and then after we've done our horizontal collision, all that's left to do is now that we've applied every kind of check and calculation to what our speed should be based on whether or not we're colliding and what buttons we're pressing, all we need to do is actually commit to the movement that we've worked out. So x, our x coordinate, plus equals husper, and our y coordinate plus equals vispa. Meaning, you know, if we're pressing left, we'll move by our horizontal speed, 2 or minus 2, and if we're jumping, we'll either apply that little burst that we give ourselves we by setting it to minus 7, and then every frame we're also adding our gravity, which will reduce that speed until, you know, it, it's really low and we're, we're falling, and we fall faster and faster and faster and faster. Technically, at the moment, there's no limit to how fast you can fall, like we would have to use something like a, a min or max statement, as you've seen in my other videos, to sort of limit how high it can go. And we move by that amount, and then all that comes together and leaves you with basically what I have here, which is just moving left and right, jumping. So every time I press space, uh, we get the spur goes to minus seven, and we launch into the air like that, and then every single frame that uh, we're adding that gravity, if you remember, and it's pulling us back down. But then when we're about to hit the floor, we move as close as possible to it, and it works all that out in a single frame, moves you as close as possible to the floor, and then um, and then you're on the floor. So, and then we can also move left and right, collide with the wall, as you can see, it works exactly the same way. And that's that. So that, in a nutshell, is everything more or less uh, you need to know about the very, very basics of platforming. I have to remind you though, this isn't um, a perfect tutorial or a perfect guide in terms of like, oh, that's how you make a platformer. Um, you know, now I can go ahead and I can just use this code forever and ever and do all kinds of crazy platformers. There's a million and one different ways to set this sort of uh, system up and there are problems with the way I've done this. Um, a specific problem that you might run into is that if you uh, collide pixel perfect with a corner, you're going to get stuck in the corner. Like it's kind of hard to replicate. Oh, there I've got it there. So I'm completely stuck in that corner now. Why that happens um, is because we're checking our horizontal collision and then we're checking our vertical collision. And so, like, if you make a pixel perfect collision with a corner, like, uh, it'll see, it'll check down, it'll see, oh, there's nothing below me, oh, it's nothing to the right of me, and it'll go ahead with your movement as if it's totally fine, and then you'll end up wedged into the corner, and then it'll always be like, oh, there's something below me, I can't move, oh, there's something to the right of me, I can't move. 
and you know you'll you'll just get stuck. Um, the solution to that, therefore, is to write a system that checks your collision, um, checks both directions at once. But that's a lot more complicated and is kind of beyond the scope of this tutorial. It's just, but this system is it is functional and it will give you kind of a good grounding in how a lot of these different concepts work, so how c to make collision work and how to make it so you're moving to you know we're checking ahead of ourselves to see if we're colliding and then we stop colliding you know it gives you the foundation to move onwards and it's really just um, I've written this just in the simplest way I've just gone for both effectiveness efficiency and mostly just the easiest to read um, system that I could come up with for creating the kind of basic platforming environment which will hopefully give you a head start and will be good for like you know writing prototypes and sort of testing your ideas out and all that kind of thing um, and is a very 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 good starting point to move you along the line to writing a properly polished kind of engine because if you're working with just the drag and drops and the solids and that kind of stuff you will run into exactly the same kind of problems where you know diagonals might get you stuck or you know you get stuck inside your walls through some means or you end up teleporting for some reason and you don't know why and there's there's all sorts of different glitches and stuff that can happen when you're working with like collisions and gravity and movement and that sort of stuff so it's a much better idea in my opinion at least to be writing your code so that you have as much control and understanding of exactly what's happening every single frame as possible so that you it makes it easier to fix those problems because there's nothing more frustrating than a weird glitch or problem in your game and you've no idea where it's coming from or why or you know, have any idea how to even start fixing it so I will actually I plan this is a very basic version of a longer either special or series I'm going to do on platformers because I mean this isn't the code at all I used for writing well it's close to it but it's not the code I use for writing things like perspective or other platform games that I've made or are working on so but I, I work on platformers a ton and I, I know a lot about working on them so um, I feel I'm in a good position to write sort of a bit more of an expert kind of tutorial on them at some point. Um, at the moment I wanted to give one that kind of appeals to both audiences at once, so I know some people were looking for kind of to get in there and get in on this advanced stuff and kind of start cracking away at making uh, you know an awesome pl super platform game. And I know there are people like who don't know anything at all who wanted to kind of get a grip for how it's done and kind of understand the basic concepts and that kind of stuff so it's aimed at them as well but it's also there to demonstrate that doing a platform game well is not easy <laughs> it's not the easiest project to start off with um, because you can see all this you know the complexity of this code is way above and beyond the complexity of anything we've done so far in a relative sense it's not that complicated you know but like and you know I've written this as simply as I can, um, so I mean that should say something about when this is as simple as I can write it. You know how um, how difficult and convoluted it can become later on. There are guides and stuff on writing platformers in just the the drag and drop system, but honestly, they're they're not good for much more than you know prototyping and sort of testing out your ideas. Um, but I mean, I could do a guide on those if that's something you guys are interested in and would be shorter and less complicated and possibly easier to follow. But I ho I'm hoping to sort of strike a bit of a middle ground so that, you know, the newer people can get into that and um, the people who are really wanting to sort of, you know, get into some more complex concepts have a little bit of a, a taste of stuff to come. Because I am going, as I said, I'm going to do a tutorial on writing kind of a full-fledged like proper functioning platform engine at some point <laughs> I'm promising it now <laughs> I'm dreading actually doing it because it's a lot a lot of stuff to get through and I'm not in super comfortable yet with doing these really long and sort of in-depth complex tutorials as you can see I was just sort of stumbling trying to get through explain exactly what this does and what this does and what this does and what this does so you know uh, that when I do do that tutorial, it is going to make a lot of assumptions about your abilities, so it won't be aimed at people who are beginners at all. Um, it's going to assume you like all of this is like baby talk to you, like you knew all of this already. You weren't, you know, you could have written this in your sleep. Um, 
So, I mean, that tutorial is probably going to be way beyond the scope of uh, possibly a lot of people watching. But it's something I want to do because I know a lot of people are interested in that and people, you know, if they have the motivation to, to do um, that kind of system will probably get a lot out of it and that's kind of important. Um, but at the same time, for the rest of everyone else, I'm going to continue sort of building up at steady pace we're going and sort of try and put out content that's for experts and for beginners and hopefully get everyone get everyone better. <laughs> that's really the plan. So, wow, that was a really long waffle about nothing at the end there, but um, at least it's at the end and not at the beginning, so... Although I think I waffled a bit at the beginning as well. But oh well. Either way, that's a tutorial. That's how you make a simple platform game, Game Maker Studio, step by step, as clearly and concisely as I could manage. <laughs> Apologies if it was hard to follow. And um, I'll see you guys on whatever the hell kind of tutorial I do next. So yep, yeah, thanks for watching. See you next time, guys.